And we're back with more of the Pope on film. Yes. It's been a while since I've yet held a bunny <laughs> in this house. Isn't it amazing? Yes. It's a while. If you're like me, you're no doubt a big fan of this podcast, The Pope on Film. I mean, who is it nowadays in this day and age? It's sweeping the nation. It's swiffering the nation. But only real fans, true hardcore fans, lifers, ride or die, who have been with us since day one, back when this podcast started, Way back in 1994, when the Pope on Film was actually a dial-up BBS. Yes. Remember those days, buddy? Yeah, we were running Wildcat. Yeah. It was crazy. You could download a picture of Bunny and I. The download took uh, about 29 hours. It was worth it. It was worth it. Yeah. What I really loved, what I really loved is it always made my day seeing it come up in ASCII art like King Diamond's Lair. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. You, you, you knew you were going to find some good wares there. Yeah. So true fans of this podcast would know two things about us, two fundamental facts about the both of us, America's hottest project casting couple, Bunny and Maywin. First and foremost, Bunny, is the fact that when you're not recording the podcast, you are actually a counselor. You counsel trouble at risk teens. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about that, Bunny? Uh, yes, I, I counsel them. Um, most specifically, what we do is we run a run a series of of uh, psychological profiles. You know, kind of questionnaires where there's really no right answer, you know, and it's you need the number two pencil because we scan them all down. We're dealing with a lot of troubled kids out there, uh, and that problem is not being addressed. But any of them who show a um, a propensity uh, to be a clown they are sent over to me and i try to help them enroll in clown college and help design a good face for them and and work on the paperwork on getting the face registered so that they can begin their new career as a professional clown and you really gotta enroll them in clown college because if they don't enroll in clown college a lot of them just become clown strippers yeah yeah but the, the 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 back alley clowns, which we really don't want to see happen. These people have had enough problems in their lives as it is, you know. Yeah. And, but yeah, and that's the thing that that Republicans don't realize is that by getting rid of Rocco versus Wade, you're just gonna make legal clown abortions. Uh, you're just going to make clown abortions more difficult, more dangerous. People are going to be going to back alley clown abortionists, and it, it's just, it's very difficult. And the second fact, the second fact that you would know about me is that I'm a big fan of history. I love it, but I'm also a storyteller. So in this segment, what we like to do is take a story from the history books, maybe one that people don't know too well, and reword it by my own unique storytelling style, and that's what this is, another educationally uneducational installment of Dave's Historic Abstraction! Dun, 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 Shack Challenge. Anywho, this week on the old Shappity Shack Shack, we will be discussing a wild bit of sports history that's not only batshit insane, but most, a lot of it actually happened right here in my small town, in my small, tiny, racist, bigoted town of Shawnee, Oklahoma. No idea that one of the craziest and most maddening shafts we've ever done on this podcast actually happened right here in my 
happen right here in my own backyard. But before getting to the shaft proper, I need to get a little bit personal. Okay. Uh, all right. So I went MIA for a few months in the beginning of 2022. I don't want to talk about it. I will not talk about it. But the point is, once I came back to Earth, I've been trying to focus on bettering myself. I've been trying to be a better person, and so far it's working. I'm trying to unplug from Twitter and the internet, spend time outside, meditating, being quiet, listening to music. I've been try I'm on new antidepressants, and that's been helping. I'm going to the movies again, which uh, really helps with my self-care. And I was nervous about bringing this up on the podcast, but uh, I've been going back to church. I miss it. I just missed it. I, it, 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 it as, as much as I gave up Catholicism, I just missed having a place to go to where I was quiet and there was singing and it was always, you know, one hour of my week, which was just a time that I just got to shut the fuck up, you know? And I just missed it. And so I decided to go back to church, and it's been nice. I've been going to the only Catholic church in town, St. Benedict's Catholic Church, which was built in 1907, the same year that Oklahoma was made a state. The church I go to is the same age as this state. That's what I always find fascinating, you know? Like, I used to be blown away by the movie theater downtown that was open in, in 1947. This church was open in 1907, and, and the whole thing just blows me away. I was going to go as a guy. I was going to, I, because it, I went to a Catholic church. I, I, I was a... I went to a Catholic school from first grade to eighth grade, and then after that, I spent four years in a Catholic high school teen youth group. And after that, I became a counselor in that same Catholic youth group. And then eventually, like so many people, I discovered um, drinking and drugs and women and men, and I just stopped going to church. But I miss it, and... At first, I was like, if I'm, I'm going to go back to Catholic Church every Sunday. I'm going to dress up as a guy and go to church, and my wife was... My wife is very supportive, but my wife was the one who said, I don't see why you can't go as a woman, and it's like, I, I don't want to be mugged. I don't want to be killed. I don't want to be shamed. It feels dangerous. It feels like I shouldn't do this. And so I woke up early the morning of, and it's like, I'm going to go to church. Fuck, Natasha's right. i got to go as a woman. <laughs> I'm going as a woman every week to church. And there's a part of me that's like, ah, oh, this, this might be a sin if people knew. Like, thank goodness that I have gotten pretty good at it. And it, it's so that I can go to church and it, I'm not automatically, you know, drawn and quartered. But the way that I see it is, uh, going back to church, just it, it feels like something that I, it, it's, it's something that's important to me. And uh, yeah, I get it. Catholics have a hard time with trans people. I get that. But you, you know what I have a hard time with? Decades of covering up sexual abuse. So maybe don't throw about the trans woman in your church, Catholic. <laughs> so I'm all right with going back to church. It's, it's been nice. I'm going back to church on my own terms. I've been going to church every week since April 10th, which apparently was on the Sunday. I go to church and I'm like, hey, fuck it. Uh, uh, three palms. Fucking score. I live tweet each and every mass, and it's nice. And then sometimes I'll come home, and everyone's still asleep, and that's really nice. So I get to, you know, just get some coffee, go out on the veranda, dip, and listen. Nice. The bacon. Don't bring home the what? 
No, but uh, every once in a while they'll have a copy of donuts at the fellowship hall. And it's like, fuck it, yes! I, sometimes I'll bring donuts home, but uh, one morning I I went to Wendy's and I got a breakfast baconator. But then after that I went to McDonald's and got hash browns and coffee, and then I brought it home and I'm and I, I eat it I'm like oh I mean a Wendy's baconator and I'm having a McDonald's hash brown and a McDonald's coffee, and some people lost their shit about that. And it's like, I'm sorry, but, uh, does anyone, can anyone tell me what Wendy's coffee tastes like? No, that's what I thought. <laughs> and they don't have, like, hash browns at Wendy's for breakfast. They've got these weird, like, breakfast fries, and they suck. But their breakfast baconator is the greatest uh, breakfast food of all time. So, it, it, I bring stuff sometimes. This morning I brought popcorn. And donuts. So I do bring some stuff home. Uh, so last week I'm all dolled up and I go to church and I usually sit around the back. I've been slowly but surely getting closer. Like I think today I sat six rows from the back. So I'm getting better. I'm getting closer. Uh, I usually sit around the back and there's pamphlets in the back. There's free pamphlets and they always grab a shit ton of pamphlets. Some of my favorites include Sex and Contraception for Catholics. Really? I believe that Catholic contraception is just uh, right before you come, you just say a little prayer. And that's basically contraception for Catholics. The Catholic mom nurturing your household. Well, well, true Catholic contra contraception is picking up a sweet altar boy. Oh, they're on to you, Pastor Dan. <laughs> yeah. This is my favorite. What Catholics should know about Scientology. And I was, that one pissed me off because Scientology is actually a religion that was created by a man named L. Ron Hubbard. They believe it, and it's like, oh, wait, this is a serious look at Scientology. And there's no mentions of Xenu. There's no mentions of the, the like, it, it's a serious look, and it's like, oh, this pisses me off. I mean, this would be a hit job, but, but no, we, this isn't Southern Baptist, it's Catholics, and they're all like, oh, let's take a serious look at Scientology. Oh, you disappointed me, Catholic. <laughs> Um. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that pissed me off. Well, last week, uh, just had it in my hands. I got a copy of the church's visitors tour guide. Uh, welcome to St. Benedict's Catholic Church, built in 1907, a visitors tour guide. And oh my god, this sent me down a crazy ass rabbit hole, and that's the shaft. It's crazy, it's ridiculous. It's unbelievable. It's maddening. I'll give you an exciting new reason to hate the Supreme Court. And there's a, at one point, Shades of Elmer McCurdy. Uh, yeah. So, uh, buddy, uh, let's get to the shaft proper now. Do you know? Put the first one up. Put the first one up. Do you know who Jim Thorpe is? alternative school here in town. Thank you, Amber. We will be getting to the reasons for that in just a little bit. Oh, yeah, that's the... So glad about this because 
because, uh, uh, because, okay, okay, we're going to explain all of that today in our chat. So Jim Thorpe, an American athlete, an Olympic gold medalist, the first Native American to win the gold medal, and considered to be one of the best, if not the best, overall athletes of all time. You can go ahead, you can go ahead and put up the second picture, Bunny. In fact, his gold medal was presented to him. He won two gold medals in the 1912 Olympics. His two gold medals were presented to him by King Gustav V of Sweden and Tsar Nicholas II of Russia. And at the time of the medal ceremony, King, uh, King Gustav said to Jim Thorpe, you are the greatest athlete in the world. Jim Thorpe, one of the world's best athletes, Besides being the first Native American to win gold, he also played professional basketball, professional baseball, and both collegiate and professional football. Considered by many to be one of the best football players of all time, strange fact, he played both baseball for the New York Giants from 1913 to 1915, and also in 1917, and then in 1925, he played pro football for the New York Giants. Do you want me to walk you through that again? Sure. Okay. <laughs> for the New York Giants. He also played pro football for the New York Giants. Yeah, yeah well, that's... That vaguely rings a bell as being possible. Apparently there was a pro uh, baseball team called the New York Giants and there was a pro football team also called the New York Giants. I, am, I was figure out that there was never a pro basketball team called the New York Giants. Yeah. If, we, if I'm not mistaken and we're talking sports so it's highly probable but I'm pretty sure the New York Giants became the Dodgers. And then the football team became the Giants. Then the football, well, the football team just stayed the Giants. Yeah, they stayed the Giants, yeah. I really think that for the symmetry of the thing, the New York Knicks should change their name to the New York Giants. Yes, they should. Just... I, I just think that that's fair. He was also because what the hell's a knickerbocker anyway? Yeah. I, I just killed a mosquito. Or he was also the first ever president of the American Pro Football Association, which would eventually become the NFL. So this, and then he was also a, a football coach. This man did it all in the 1920s and 1930s was not the Michael Jordan of America. He was three Michael Jordans in one. Uh, Jim Thorpe was, in the 1910s and 20s and 30s, what Michael Jordan wanted to be. Michael Jordan, you are just amazing at basketball. Oh yeah? Well, I'm gonna play baseball. I'm playing baseball now. What do you think about me playing baseball? And everyone said, you're such a good basketball player, though. You're just so great at playing basketball. So you just knew, you just knew that Michael Jordan wanted to Jim Thorpe it up. But America got together as a collective and said, no, no. Just the fact of being a basketball player. So that, that, that makes me feel good. Here's a fun fact about Jim Thorpe. Okay. So he won his two gold medals in 1912 at the Summer Olympics held in Stockholm, Sweden from May 5th to July 22nd, 1912. It was the first Olympics to feature both the decathlon and their new sport, the pentathlon. And for those of you who don't know what the pentathlon is, it's basically the same thing as the decathlon, but while you're doing all of the different sports, you're just as Uh-huh. I assume that a pentathlon is just any episode of life. 
Yeah. What was that? Oh, yes. I'm assuming that that's a fantastic one. So, uh, people, Americans, are notoriously racist. They're notoriously racist AS. So, right before Jim Thorpe was to compete in the Olympics, some douchebag stole his shoes. Oh, I've heard this story. <laughs> yeah, so Jim Thorpe is like, crap. How can I compete in the Olympics without shoes? And, and the judges are like, well, you better find some shoes somewhere. So he finds two mismatched pair of shoes, one of which he pulled from the freaking trash. And not only did he win gold, Olympic gold medals, two Olympic gold medals, but he won them with two mismatched shoes, including one trash shoe. Yes. I think he should get like an extra gold medal for that. But here's the fucked up part. Like I said, people are notoriously racist. So the Olympics happened in 1912, and a year later, in 1913, the Olympic Committee said, Hey, Jim Thorpe, uh, so we did some investigating, and we figured out that from 1909 to 1910, you played semi-professional minor league baseball. That means that you're a professional and not an amateur. We're taking your gold medal. Fuck you. Oh. So they stripped him of his two gold medals. And not only is that notoriously fucked up, but also there was a rule in the books that said if you are going to strip anyone of Olympic medals, you have 30 days to do it. But the Olympic Committee said, a year later said, Jim Thorpe, we're taking your fucking medal because you played semi-professional minor league baseball for a year. And Jim Thorpe's like, but that was minor league baseball and I won gold in the decathlon and pentathlon. And they're like, we don't care. We're still taking your medals. It was generally believed at the time that the reason why they took Jim Thorpe's two gold medals was not because, oh, you're, you're a semi-professional and not an amateur, but because, damn it, we gave two gold medals to a Native American. We gotta find some way to take that shit back. Uh, it's really fucked up. Eventually, his gold medals were reinstated, but that's a whole other fucking story, because his medals weren't reinstated until 1983, and also, he was... They reinstated his gold medals and they made him the co-champion. So he's in oh. first place. He's the co-first place winner now. Okay. So, and you can always count on the Olympic Committee to be racist faster. So well, on that on that part, like, what do you do? It's not the other guy's fault that they did this. Because because then that would ha mean having to strip him of his medals that they gave him. You know what I mean? So, like... It's fucked up. It's fucked up. They never should have taken it from Jim Thorpe in the first place. So, Jim Thorpe, he was born in the year question mark. Yes. Because Oklahoma wasn't a state yet, and there weren't records as to his birth. Uh, his, historians believe that he was born in Prague, Oklahoma, but in numerous in Prague, 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 he was born in, it, 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 historians believe he was born somewhere around the vicinity of the town of Prague, Oklahoma. But uh, Jim Thorpe himself repeatedly said that his hometown was Shawnee, Oklahoma, which is where I currently live. Uh, Why should we believe him? Because he's the one who said Shut up, Jim. What do you know? <laughs> We'll figure this out. They believe he was either born in 1886 or 1887 or 1888. 
The only real record that they have was his baptism. He was baptized as Catholic. He was one of America's greatest athletes. He died on March 28, 1953. In 1951, they made a movie about him, and it's called like Jim Thorpe, All American Hero. You know who played him? The legendary Native American actor, Burt Lancaster. Hey. <clears throat> Hollywood. <laughs> Hollywood. God, that's right up there with Charlton Heston playing a Mexican. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. from Chinese. Down the movie uh -huh. and see it now. Uh, so he died on the twenty eighth. Apart from Bruce Lee, who invented? Who who wrote it? What? Cliff Booth. No, I do not believe Ki Cliff Booth. You know, but I, I had read a story that it was based on a stuntman who was primarily a wrestler who was able to take Bruce Lee down to the mat, basically. And that... Okay, I, I can, I can kind of see that. In the novelization that I read uh, earlier this year, uh, it specifically says that the way that Cliff Booth was able to fuck up Bruce Lee so much is when he said, "All right, now do that again." That 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 it's a it, it was a psychological thing that he said, "Okay, best out of three falls, Bruce Lee. Hit me with your best shot. Oh, you hit me with that. Okay, now try it again." knowing that the person that he is fighting will then do the exact same move again, which he now knows how to counter. So he just has to lose the first fight, and then he knows he'll win the second fight, and then for the third fight, that's the actual fight. That was how it's explained in the book. And okay, I can kind of see that, but still, I don't I don't think that with would and uh, hardcore like that. Retired from sports just as the Great Depression happened, so he had a really hard time after he uh, retired from sports. Uh, he ended up an alcoholic. He ended up with a bunch of money problems, and he died of heart failure on March 28, 1953. His funeral took place on Monday, April 13th. 1953 at St. Benedict's Catholic Church in Shawnee, Oklahoma. <laughs> which is the church that I go to. Well, because I got the freaking visitor's tour guide and it's like, oh, here is where we have the blessed sacrament in the tabernacle. Here are the candles. Here are the stations of the cross. Oh, the 14th window is located at the north entry. The 21st window is located at the north side. And right at the back, the back page, right here. In this church, the funeral mass was held for Jim Thorpe. And they reprint an article in the Shawnee News Star newspaper from April 14, 1953. Thorpe given final farewells, and I'd like to read it to you. Okay, that's fine, that's fine, okay. Um, uh, goodbye, dear, I've brought you back home. Mrs. Jim Thorpe, widow of the world-famous athlete, cried out these words in the Marble Hall of Fairview Mausoleum on Monday as she departed from her husband's briar for the final time. Thorpe's body was placed in a crypt in the south wing of the mausoleum, following solemn requiem high mass at St. Benedict's Catholic Church. It will remain in the temporary resting place until erection of a 100 
$100,000 memorial to be built in Shawnee in his honor. And then I thought, wow, you mean to tell me that there's a big memorial to Jim Thorpe here in Shawnee, Oklahoma? I'm going to have to look this up. Type, 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 type. Oh, wait, all I'm seeing is shit in Pennsylvania. This must be a mistake. Let me keep looking. Shit in Pennsylvania. What's the deal? Looking. So here's what happened. Uh, this is crazy. So, Jim Thorpe's family is raising money for the memorial. And all the people in the town of Shawnee, Oklahoma, so proud of their local boy, and they're raising money for Jim Thorpe. But unbeknownst to his family, Jim Thorpe's third wife, Patricia Thorpe, Sells his car! Sells his what? Oh! Because at the time of his death, uh, they were having financial problems, and Patricia Thorpe finds out that there's these two municipalities in Philadelphia that are hoping to lure in tourists somehow, and those two municipalities buy the corpse of Jim Thorpe off of his third wife, Patricia, the corpse is sent from St. Benedict's Catholic Church in his own town of Johnny to two small towns in Philadelphia, and once they get the corpse, they get these two municipalities, they are merged, and they form a town which they call Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania, despite the fact that Jim Thorpe never fucking went there! Mm. Getting Elmer McCurdian around here. So there's a town in Pennsylvania called Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania that Jim Thorpe has never been to, but that's where the memorial is, and not here in Shawnee where he was born and where he lived and where his funeral happened. It's fucking insane, but it gets crazier. In 2010, Jim Thorpe's living son, Jack, I've got six and a half minutes, I got. Jim Thorpe's son, Jack, says, I am suing the town of Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania, to get my father's body back. And this was his plan. There's a thing called NAGPRA, the Native American Graves Protection and Reparations Act. And it says, hey, uh, we, we, the U.S. government, know we fucked you Native Americans over. We took your bodies and we buried them all over the place. We will gladly give them back to you and bury them wherever you want. I mean, as long as it's not a muse in a museum or anything, you will gladly give the bodies back. And Jim Thorpe's son, Jack, said, Ha! I am invoking the NEGPRA Act. They have to give me the body back. And a judge ruled and said, the town of Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania, the entire town, is a museum. You're not getting your father's body back. Fucked up. So then he kept going. He was appealing. He was still in the court system. And eventually, the third court of appeals ruled, and they said, okay, that judge who said that, that Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania, is a museum, that's fucked up. It's not a museum. Uh, it, uh, Jack, you can have the body back. Hey, Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania, send the body back to Shawnee, Oklahoma, where it can be buried, where it's supposed to be. So then the town of Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania sued. It went all the way to the Supreme Court. And in 2015, the Supreme Court ruled that Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania was in fact a museum and that uh, it, Jim Thorpe's son can't have his dad's body back. So there's a lot of people who are saying this right now, but I'm saying it for two reasons. Fuck the Supreme Court. That's some messed up shit. What the hell? Why is Jim Thorpe's body in Pennsylvania in a town he's never even been to? He did go to school in Pennsylvania. He did go to a school in Pennsylvania, hundreds of miles away from the town that he lived, that, that his body is now resting in. He never went, Jim Thorpe never went to Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania. His body should be in Shawnee, Oklahoma, but it's not. It's in a town that he hasn't been. 
and it's the Supreme Court's fault that Jim Thorpe's corpse isn't <coughs> That is a messed up story. And I am surprised that, that this whole thing happened in my backyard. At my church. I'm also surprised that I can say my church. But there you go. Uh, yeah. I, I, every Sunday I go to the church that had Jim Thorpe's funeral. So weird. But yeah. If that's messed up, they sold his corpse. Who sells a corpse? I mean, what are you, Elmer McCurry's wife? <laughs> that is shocking to me. Yeah, yeah but that's shocking. <laughs> yeah, we'll give him back. It's messed up. And nowadays, Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania gets tourists from all over the world who come to their art shows, their craft shows, their art festivals. And people, a lot of people come to Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania. There you go, I forgot. Uh, a lot of people come to Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania, and they go, oh, I love this place. It is such a nice uh, art festival that happens every year. Your fucking name, though. Oh, a memorial. Whatever. Like, so many people nowadays don't even know why it's called Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania. It's called Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania because they bought a car. It's messed up. It's what it is. I am and I know that I have said this before on the podcast. I am shocked that more people don't know this story. Well, see, see now, I, 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 of course, I've always assumed that that's where he was from. Especially since fucking everything there is, I mean, it's Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania, but then it's in, in Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania, everything is fucking Jim Thorpe. You know? So, like, the Jim Thorpe High School and, and, and all of that shit. And that's and that's right the area. Like I don't think she was actually in Jim Thorpe itself, but she was real close to it because it just came up in conversation all the time. You know, another connection to you. Yeah. So so like Jeannie says, we are we are both connected to this story. From both sides. Mm -hmm. We got this story up against the wall and we're sandwiching this bitch. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. I'm going to let the stream drop out this time and just bring it back up. So anybody watching the stream, which is nobody, just wait a minute. We'll be right on back. Uh, we'll come back and go on break. Yes. So, uh, join us next week for more Educationally Uneducational Fun with Steve Historic Approximation. And God help us in the future. Everyone. When, when, we're, when I'm at a Catholic Mass and everyone's like saying a big... It just cut. Mm -hmm. And it cut hard. Mm -hmm. Because I'm going to play Dabney on the break gotcha. for the first time ever. And if I take break now, we're not streaming.